And with that, welcome inside this midweek edition of Big Ten. Today, I'm Rick Pizzo. As promised, Mike Huff will be in this chair shortly to talk about the weekend coming up on the Big Ten Baseball Diamond. And we have a really cool interview with Neil Shipley, Ohio State men's golfer, the low amateur at the Masters this past week. We'll talk about his entire experience, including a final round at Augusta with none other than Tiger Woods. But we begin with the big story and a jam-packed weekend of spring football inside the Big Ten. Kicks off Thursday night, Indiana's spring game. You can see it right here on the Big Ten Network. 8 o'clock start time. Iowa has a spring practice on Saturday. Michigan can be seen on Fox. Illinois, Michigan State, again, right here on the Big Ten Network. Iowa always intriguing. Kirk Ferentz more than a quarter century in the biz. Doesn't believe in the whole spring game concept. So it'll be a spring, spring practice open to the fans inside Carver Hawkeye. And for more on that open spring practice, all thing Hawkeye football related, welcome into the doctor. Scott Docterman of The Athletic covers Iowa as well as anyone. And Scott, I want to start at the top because there are a lot of folks on the outside who thought Kirk Ferentz has now been coached for a quarter century. His son has been dismissed, not returning as OC. They got back to the champ game. It is a perfect time for Kirk to step away. That's not the case. Did you get the sense that that was ever even a consideration for Coach Ferentz? I think for one day back in October, right after his son was dismissed, I thought that there was an opportunity for there for this to happen. But then uh, he really started to focus on the future and really took this uh, under consideration that he wanted to make sure this program continues to improve. And Iowa, of course, on the defensive side of the ball is elite, but the offense has been so bad. I think he wants to really improve that. So um, it only took about a day or two before he came out with it. And then we all kind of realized that Kirk Ferentz is going to be here, whether it's one more year or five more years, but he's going to be the coach in 2024. Well, let me follow up on that because age is just a number. And those of us who are lucky enough to hang out with Kirk know he is young at heart, loves this game, doesn't have a lot of other outside interests maybe other than his family. I know you're not in the guessing business, but how much longer do you think Kirk wants to stay the head football coach at Iowa? I think it could be a couple more years. Um, I think during the COVID year, he realized how much fun it was. And I use that in air quotes. Uh, to go out and garden <laughs> and do other things around the house and realize that's not exactly what he wants to do with his life. And and frankly, he's told me before that, you know, once he gets done with this uh, with this job at Iowa, he wouldn't mind just going around and touring other practices. So football's in his blood. And I, I don't expect him to leave um, unless this it looks like it's an opportunity that they just can't fix here. So I would expect him to be here probably three more years. Uh, he and I have had many conversations about enjoying that rhythm that you know with the family, your job. He's obviously settled in, very comfortable at what he does. But there appears to be some change coming offensively. Tim Lester's the new OC, takes over for Brian Ferentz. You look back to his career as the head guy at Western, and Scott, they were a huge contrast from what we've seen from Iowa over the years. They were high scoring. They were RPO. They were spread based. How do those two mix together? It's going to be really interesting, and this is probably the key as to whether Iowa is a competitive team for a playoff spot or, you know, going to be in that Outback Bowl type territory. And that is um, part of the things that I think he's employing right now is a lot of motion at pre-snap. And Iowa did a little bit of that, but not a lot last year. And what it's trying to do is kind of replace the issues that it's had with cut blocks being basically legislated out of the game. And that is keep some of that guessing going on at the second level level for linebackers and if they're able to do that with this motion and move everything with the RPOs then they feel like that their running scheme can get back to where it once was which was an elite level running attack so that's part of what we, we've noticed here at Iowa and the running backs really seem to like it because they, they have a little bit better vision than they've had in the past couple of years uh, but the passing game is something that I'm really anxious to watch on Saturday. Just how do they, how do, what's the route structure look like? What's the depth? What's, uh, what's the spacing of the field look like? It wasn't very good, as we know, the last couple of years. So there's a possibility that maybe we'll see something new. And Scott, one of the issues was, yes, you had great tight ends. You had great possession receivers. But the game breaker or lack thereof has been an issue on the outside. Is there a name or names that maybe we should be paying attention to this spring and this fall in Iowa City? 
I like Caleb Brown. He was an Ohio State recruiter initially. He was a four-star, and then he transferred to Iowa last year. He came on strong late in the year. I think he's got an opportunity kind of as a, a slot Z hybrid for Iowa to, to really take that to the next level. But, you know, one of the things Iowa has to rebuild is its wide receiver core. I mean, from 2018 through 2022, it recruited 10 scholarship wide receivers, nine of which have left the program either through the transfer portal or switched sports. So uh, they only had one that, that lasted the full race. And so they've got to get a handle on their attrition out there, which means they've got to play better because if you're a receiver, after what we've seen in the last couple of years, why would you want to stay? So I think uh, Caleb Brown is a guy to watch. I think Seth Anderson, the son of Willie Anderson, who played for the Los Angeles Rams, is another. And then there, there's a handful of freshmen that I think have a chance to make an impact. The receiver needs a good quarterback. The RPO system needs a quarterback that can read defenses. Cade McNamara was gone after week five with a torn ACL a year ago. It takes a long time to recover from that. So that recovery is somewhat still ongoing. You would say that position is unsettled. But for now, what would you guess we see opening weekend? I think it's going to be Kate McNamara. I think by all indications are that he's going to play in June or be fully ready to compete in seven on seven and do those types of things. Uh, in practice, he's able to drop back a little bit, but lateral movement, they're really trying to keep a governor on that and not allow him to, to do much laterally just to make sure that ACL is strong. I expect him to be the number one, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if Iowa decides to go to the transfer portal and uh, pick up a second quarterback, whether that's to compete or just be a backup for this year, uh, because what you saw last year is just not uh, you just can't have that at this level. It was it was the probably one of the worst uh, quarterback situations we've ever seen. And in fact, Iowa's offense was the lowest in the Big Ten in 40 years, which you can make the case that that's the worst of all time because the game has changed so much since 1984 when Northwestern was a shell of itself as a program. Uh, meanwhile, up front, the big fellas, the Caden Proctor saga has been well documented, but even without Proctor, the guys were turning on this O-line. They combined for almost 150 career starts heading into this season. Yet, I would argue that the production didn't necessarily match up with that experience a year ago. What does this unit need to do for Iowa's offense to be successful in 2024? It goes a long way with having a decent passing game. I think it goes hand in hand because then they're able to run the ball because they're able to throw the ball. And I think they've got some talent there. I'm not sure that they have the upper echelon first round draft pick out of this group, but I think they have a lot of experience. They do have some talent and it's just going to be a matter of, of being able to control the line of scrimmage. And again, in that I think some of that motion may take some of the pressure off them to make sure they hit their aiming points uh, as often as they had to in the outside stretch. They weren't able to run it very often last year. And I think this year, with the motion that, that Tim Lester is bringing in in pre-snap, I think that's going to hold some of the second-level defenders, which enabled them to get their reach blocks and, and enable the running game to go a little bit further. And, and then, of course, in the passing game, there were a lot of sacks, but they weren't all on the offensive line. I think that the, the quarterback contributed to that. And if they can find a way to, to get a better passing game, I think the line will look much better in that regard. It's taken us seven, eight minutes to get to the defense, which has long been the strength of this team. But it's also fitting because Phil Parker is such a humble guy that wants to deflect as much success as possible. Yet he is the reigning Broyles Award winner as the top assistant coach in the country. They return a ton to this defense. How good can the Hawkeye D be in 2024? I think it's possible that they're better than they were last year or the year before, and that's saying a lot considering they led the nation both years in, in average yards per play allowed. And and part of that is they returned their linebacking core and they returned the entire secondary except for Cooper DeGene, and he was out late in the year anyway. Um, you know, a little bit of a question will be up front with some of their depth because uh, they do lose some pieces there. But I do think this could be one of the best units under Phil Parker because they have that experience. They were tenacious, very disciplined. Uh, the one area that they're focusing on this year, though, is uh, turning over, getting more turnovers, which they didn't get quite as, as many as they once did last year. So, but with Jay Higgins, with Xavier Wampa, with uh, Jamari Harris, who I think will be really good. And then up front, the guy to watch is YA Black. I think he'll be a very, one of the best uh, defensive tackles in the country. So this unit's going to carry Iowa. And as much as we want to talk about the offense, 
with that defense intact, it will keep them in just about every game. And he looks looks through their their schedule. Um, really, other than going to Ohio State, is there a game on the schedule that I think Iowa is a decided underdog? Well, let's get into that because the narrative was that Iowa, more than any other team over the last couple of years, benefited from the inequity of the East and West divisions. There's no divisions in 2024. You mentioned the road game against Ohio State. You also play at UCLA. You have a home game against Washington with a divisionless Big Ten. And with that schedule, how much do you think this kind of sets the table for what's expected of Iowa in the new look Big Ten? I think this is this is a perfect schedule for Iowa. When you look at Washington, obviously the first thing that comes out is they went to the national championship. But since then, they've had, what, 26, 27 players enter the transfer portal. They're going to have several players called in the first during second rounds of the NFL draft, new coaching staff. And they're coming to Kinnick Stadium where we know that a lot of good teams come to die. And then you look at UCLA, which uh, UCLA was a good program. They lost their coach. So I don't know that there's a lot of fear really in some of these teams. I think Oregon is the one that, you know, but they're not even on Iowa's schedule. They're the one that I think people would really watch for. Um, but when you look at the inequity between the East and West, it really starts with the ceiling and the East, you know, Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State, because the rest are uh, equal to or in some cases less than what you saw in the West. Um, you know, uh, an Indiana, a Maryland, a Rutgers, Michigan State, their records were comparable, if not below, what you saw in the West with some of those teams. So I think it was really more of a matter of the ceiling in the East really clouded that perception of the entire conference and certainly uh, winning the championships uh, helped, <laughs> helped build that uh, inequity. As always, the doctor filling that Iowa prescription for all Hawkeye fans out there. Scott Docterman of The Athletic, always great to catch up. Appreciate the insight and enjoy the open spring practice this weekend in Iowa City. Thanks for having me on, Rick. And today's big stat brought to you by Old National Bank, the number one number of amateurs to make the cut last week at Augusta. Neil Shipley of Ohio State, not just making the cut, Shot one under 71 in the opening round. Got to play with Tiger Woods in the final round. Go to Butler Cavan, hang with Scotty Scheffler for a bit. He touched every single base you could possibly touch at a tradition unlike any other. And we are absolutely thrilled to be joined by Neil Shipley today. Uh, Pre-interview, I'm geeking out trying to get all the ins and outs of Augusta because it's some place that very few people ever get to experience other than being a fan. So I want to know, Neil, for you. And I know as the USAM runner-up, you got the opportunity to play Augusta before the Masters. What was it like that first drive up Magnolia Lane when you realized you're about to play a course that's probably more famous than any other in the world, maybe save St. Andrews? It, it, it's surreal. I mean, uh, the drive down is so beautiful, and it's one of those places that you kind of feel like you might not ever get to play until you're actually there. Um, what they don't tell you, though, is I, I didn't know what exit to take on the roundabout my first go around. So I, <laughs> I did, you know, a little, little did a little 360 around at once. Kind of looked like a little bit of an idiot, but it was uh, it was such a fun little drive and uh, it's such a special, special golf course. Hey, listen, it's a once you get past that first gatehouse with the guard that's making sure you're supposed to be there. It's OK. I'm sure you are not the first person to ever miss that turn and I'm sure there were so many I can't believe this is happening moments but during Masters week was there one that kind of stood out to you where you realized I've done it I've gotten to a place where very few amateurs ever get to get yeah I think the uh the experience shaking Tiger was his hand on the first tee and teeing it up with him was pretty unbelievable I don't I don't know how many amateurs have played with him in a, ma in, a, in a major, but I mean, that was once in a lifetime, probably. All right, I want to get to more of that final round in just a bit, but I want to start at the beginning of the week, and I understand you did get to stay at least one night in the famous Crow's Nest right there on the grounds. What were those accommodations like, and what was that night like for you? Uh, you know, they're, they're, it's really cool. It's great to be up there with your fellow competitors and enjoy it. Um, but it's pretty tight quarters. The shower comes up to my chest. And <laughs> we, had, uh, we had a kid from Georgia Tech who was uh, six foot eight, Krista Lampert, and he didn't even have a chance to shower up there. Was not, we didn't have a prayer of it. Um, uh, but and it's just a really special spot. You think about the history and how many amateurs have stayed up there, the names like Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer, and, and you, you name them, and they've stayed up there in that crow's nest. So it's pretty, uh, you just kind of can feel the history when you're up there. 
and I know you were trying to take it all in, but you were also there to compete. I understand you were one of the first players on the range on Monday morning, and the only other guy there was the guy that you played with on Sunday, Tiger Woods. When you get to Augusta National during tournament week and you go out there for your first practice round, what are you trying to learn and what are you trying to gain and understand that you're able to take to the first tee on Thursday? I was just trying to adjust to the uh, golf course conditions, mostly the speed of the greens, the firmness of the greens. Um, I've had a lot of time to learn the golf course, so I kind of knew where to hit it. It was just about making those slight adjustments for the week up. You obviously weren't overwhelmed by the moment or the course. That first round 71 certainly showed that. What did you do so well on that day? And do you remember what the feeling was like as you put it out for that one underscore? Yeah, I think I just managed my golf ball, managed my misses so well that day. Um, you know, the golf course is a lot about where you leave it, uh, giving yourself easy two putts for par on the difficult holes. And, you know, when you miss a green, missing at the right spot. So that was such a such a really good day for me on the course management. And it really made my, my you know, round super easy and pretty stress-free. Even on Friday, when the best players in the world struggled, you shot 76, which is well under the average. There were many players, major winners, who said Friday were the toughest conditions they've ever played in at any major. How would you describe what Friday was like? Uh, I mean, Friday was a bloodbath. Uh, it was, you know, coming around Amen Corner was so difficult, 10, 11, 12, 13. I don't even, they must have been playing those four holes, five over par at least. I mean, on 11, played as a par five. Um, for sure. I mean, it's straight into the wind and 520 yards. I know most guys laid up uh, instead of trying to hit wood into that green. So it was yeah, it was brutal, but I think we did a good job on Friday. I stumbled around those holes, but then really gathered myself coming into the final stretch of holes and finished well and was able to make the cut comfortably. Go ahead and play your third round. I know you're probably a little bit disappointed with that third round score, but as the third round winds down and the tee times are released for Sunday, you find out who you are playing with. Do you remember exactly what you thought when you saw Neil Shipley and Tiger Woods? I, I didn't know what to think. I was, I, I was like kind of, uh, kind of shocked at first. And then I started to get worried that he might not come up to play because, you know, he just shot 82. His body was just in such bad shape. And, you know, he, he doesn't need to prove anything to anyone. You know, he's, he's the GOAT. Uh, so, you know, when I actually saw him on the range on Sunday and I knew it was actually going to happen, I was so excited and over the moon. You know, many people have said that Tiger later in his career is a much different person than Tiger earlier in his career, that he's more willing to chat with his playing partners, engage with the fans. He's realizing that not necessarily the end, but that he's certainly in the twilight of his career. What was your experience spending four and a half hours walking Augusta like with the GOAT? Oh, it was really cool. He was really welcoming towards me. He chatted it up with me a bunch. So I was really appreciative of him making me feel welcome and comfortable out there with him. And uh, we got to go and tell a bunch of stories to each other and talk about golf and everything. And it was uh, it was a great experience. And uh, Tiger's just, uh, it's funny. He's just like a normal guy. You know, he has a family who he loves. He, you know, he's got two kids who are going through their journeys of growing up. And it's cool to kind of hear about them and uh, hear about Charlie and Sam. And uh, I also got to talk to him about golf and the state of golf and, you know, uh, just everything like that is really cool. And to finish off the week as low am, you head to Butler Cabin. You're there for the green jacket ceremony. I mean, you got to you got to experience it all, man, from appetizer all the way to the dessert course. Did it sink in Sunday night or did it take a couple of days for you to realize what you had just been able to enjoy and accomplish? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it took a little while to sunk, sink in. You know, uh, I don't think it really hit me until Monday morning and I was going through the Atlanta airport and couldn't take five steps without somebody like asking me if I'm Neil Shipley or, you know, congratulating me. And that was really cool. And I think I kind of realized the magnitude of the uh, moment uh, then. Yeah. What's that been like for you? Because I know golf fans knew who you were from your amateur career, from the runner up finish to Nick last summer, but this is an entirely different audience. I mean, this has made you a person who not just golf fans, but sports fans, even casual sports fans are going to recognize and know 
Will that be something that will be comfortable to you in the coming weeks and months? Yeah, I think I think I'm starting to get used to it. Um, it it's really cool and being able to do all these uh, all these shows and you know talk to national media has been unbelievable. Um, but I've been uh, I've been really really enjoying that part of it a lot. All right, so let's finish here. What's next for Neil Shipley? This is kind of a tough act to follow, Neil, if we're being honest about it. Yeah, yeah, I got to have the our home event, the uh, Kepler Invitational here uh, this weekend, and then we move on to Big Tens and regionals, and you know, finishing out our uh, college career strong. Uh, and then after that, U.S. Open at Pinehurst. So a lot of exciting things down the pipe. What a terrific spring and summer. Off to a phenomenal start. Neil Shipley, we really appreciate the time. Know it has been a whirlwind. You taking a few minutes here is phenomenal. Wish you the best of luck this spring and summer with everything. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. Here is the weekend slate on the Big Ten baseball diamond. Top of that list, Maryland, Nebraska. A couple of teams with a ton of talent. One perhaps playing above weight. The other has not lived up to expectations so far this season. Other important series on the list include Indiana, Minnesota as well. And to break it all down, talk to you about each of these matchups. Welcome in Big Ten Network baseball analyst Michael Huff. Let's start in Iowa City, Rutgers and Iowa. This is an intriguing series, mainly because of the pitching that each team will bring onto the field. Yeah, you know, Rutgers right now first in the Big Ten in hitting. Ironically, Iowa second. We all thought about the big three arms for Iowa. You think about Obermuller, you think about Morgan, Brody Brecht, who preseason possibly yeah. a top ten. None of those three have really lived up to the expectations yet. So for Iowa, you're going home. You expect these three to come through at some point, and hopefully all three start to click as we get to that second half of the year. But Rutgers finally won a series. They're kind of below 500 in the Big Ten, but so much talent hitting-wise, led by Josh Carota grauer who MVP of the Cape Cod League. So these are two of the powerhouses in the Big Ten, and it's going to be interesting to see who comes out on top. All three of those games on Big Ten Plus, Rutgers obviously has lost so much talent, especially offensively yes. over the last couple of years with those veteran teams. Maryland and Nebraska, you'll see two teams that came into the year with pretty lofty expectations. Maryland, understandably so, based on what they had done, not just in the Big Ten, but in the postseason after the last couple of years. Terps are just 5-7 and seven in the Big Ten through 12 games. And even though Nebraska, disappointingly, gave up a ninth-inning lead to Creighton on Tuesday, Will Bolt still doing a terrific job with the Huskers. Well, and Will Bolt right now is doing everything right with the Huskers in terms of a team that lost. You think about Max Anderson, Bryce Matthews, that middle combination, shortstop, second baseman, over 130 RBIs combined, over 40 home runs combined. So everyone was expecting Nebraska to take a step back, and all of a sudden it seems like they've taken a step forward. So, you know, kudos to Will Bolt and to Matt Swope. You know, these are two guys that are perfect for these universities. Both guys played, respectively, Nebraska and Maryland. Maryland. So for, for Matt to step in as, as Vaughn left, it was perfect. It was seamless. They're non-conference, but like you said, five and seven. And the Maryland bats, I'm expecting a little bit more. So it'll be very intriguing this weekend. It is a really important RPI weekend for both these teams. If you want to have a chance to be considered for the NCAAs without having to make a run at the Big Ten tournament, exactly. this is the kind of series you take two out of three, or even if you sweep, you are in a much better position than you were, obviously, heading into the weekend. Michigan, Ohio State yeah. may not get quite as much pub on the baseball diamond as it does as in the football, football field, but, but it is still the game. It's the game between these two teams for sure. And Tracy Smith struggled preseason, but all of a sudden he has these guys playing the ball he wants. You know, they have won four series in a row, haven't swept anybody, but haven't been beaten by anybody. So two and one, two and one. So they sit really in a good position right now. And Bill Mazziello, you got to tip your cap. Second year at Ohio State, coming from TCU, and with a club that you thought might be a little bit young, missing a piece or two, a couple talented pitchers, a couple talented players. They have the second best RPI right now in the Big Ten at 40. So they are clicking on all cylinders. Now, it's ironic they're only 18 and 15, expected a little bit more, but you know you can throw out the records when these two are playing. It's going to be very exciting. That goes to show you how hard that schedule has been to have an RPI that high with a yes. record that's three games above 500. Illinois and your alma mater, Northwestern, battling inside battling. the state <coughs> Excuse me, yes. of Illinois this week. Now, Northwestern, I know the record is not necessarily there, but they're doing a really nice job in the fundamentals, which is what a young coaching staff oh. kind of wants from its team. And Illinois, I mean, just when you think 
Well, Dan Hartlib can't do this every year with this team. Somehow he, he somehow does. does it every exactly. single year with this team. Yeah, sitting atop the Big Ten right now. Uh, again, I thought for sure that was going to happen. Not. Um, but like you said, for Ben Greenspan, first-year coach at Northwestern, you think about the fact that they lost three or four of their best arms in the transfer portal. By far their three or four best bats, power bats as well in the transfer portal. What has he done? He has come in and said, let's get back to solid fundamental baseball. Yep. Let's make sure that nobody – we, I'm sorry, let's make sure we don't lose. If we're going to lose, they're going to beat us. Where last year, there was a lot of losses. This year, there's been virtually none. He already has more wins than all of last yep. year, and they just came off a home series against Maryland that they won. So to invite Illinois into Northwestern, I think it's going to be a lot closer. Yeah, none of those self-inflicted wounds that cost them a lot of games last year. Yep. And for a young coaching staff, a newer coaching staff, I should say, that's something that you're trying to get your guys to understand a couple other series that we'll get to with Mike a little bit later, plus his midseason awards coach. Screen. Denied. And that ball is in the hands of Sandler still. Mikey Sandler still. Taking it all the way. Touchdown, Michigan. It is time for today's big interview as we welcome in the man who brought back that interception for the pick six. Michigan defensive back Mike Sainter is still kind enough to join us as he gets ready for the 2024 NFL draft. Mike, before I look ahead of the draft, I do want to look back to the national championship. It's hard to believe it's been three months since that win brought the Natty back to Ann Arbor. How long did the glow last for you guys or, or is it still there some three months after that win? I would say, uh, you know, for guys who entered and uh, had to, you know, put their names to the draft, um, I think we, you know, transitioned pretty quick, you know, shifting our focus to getting ready for the combine and, you know, pre-draft process of training. Um, but it's funny because when I first got back to Michigan, um, I was upstairs eating with the guys, you know, breakfast. And the first thing I said was like, man, like, you know, we really just won a national championship. Um, and then Carson Barnhart, one of the alignment, he said back to me, he said, um, yeah, bro, like, it still doesn't even feel real. What was the welcoming committee like? Did you guys kind of feel like conquering heroes, for lack of a better term, when you got back to Ann Arbor? Because I know folks have been waiting a long time for Michigan to bring home another college football national championship. Yeah, just, you know, people, you know, one in the building, just, you know, happy to see us again. And, you know, our teammates, of course. Like, it's crazy how how soon everything changes. Like, you know, three months ago, I was playing with those guys. Three months later, you know, those guys are looking at me like, like, yo, you're in the NFL now. You know what I mean? And it's it's, it's kind of it's kind of a not a weird uh, transition, but in a sense, it's a little it's different, I would say. Hey, there's no better way to go out than to go out on top. And you did that as a national champ. You obviously sealed that win with the late pick of Penix. Are you a guy who likes to go back and, and kind of watch those clips? And if so, how many times do you think you've seen it? Uh, I've definitely seen it a bunch. I won't willingly just watch it myself. Uh, most like I really only watch it if I'm tagged and I'll kind of just buzz through it real quick. But I don't, you know, I won't willingly look it up. Um, you know, it's something I'm always remember, of course. If, if anything, I'd like, I like more pictures, just, you know, pictures speak a thousand words. But you know, that play itself is, is, is in history, I, I believe. So it's, it's cool to know that I'm the one that did that. Um, yeah, it's just a great feeling. Your play in the secondary was so solid over the last couple of years. And for those who maybe just caught on to the end of your career, if they didn't know, they'd be blown away to know that you obviously played your first three years on the other side of the ball. What allowed you to learn and succeed so quickly making that switch? Just, you know, having a receiver background definitely helps me anticipate, you know, while I'm playing, uh, you know, playing defense. I know what type of routes I could get. I know what situations, what type of, you know, play calls offense is like. Um, and then just, you know, being open to the coaching. Uh, you know, Coach Clink did a great job of helping me out early on. You know, my teammates, they also showing that they're trusting me, helped me, you know, play the way I played. And, just every single day being a sponge of the game, wanting to learn more, sitting in defensive staff meetings, learning the playbook, um, you know, doing all those little things definitely helped me out. Did you ever get 
a little bit of a vibe to go up to Coach Moore and say, you know, I, I still got great ball skills. Why don't you design something specifically for me? Throw me out at receiver once or twice. Why don't you? Yeah, every week I would say that to him. I said, hey, Coach, let me know what my package is. Uh, just, you know, I'm always here. I definitely still have the receiver tools in my bag. So, you know, if, if I'm needed to play offense, just let me do it. Um, yeah. And, and never, you know, never got used, but I definitely will go up to him often and, you know, just put it in his, you know. Right. Meanwhile, the, the defensive staff, by the way, Mike, is telling Coach Moore, no chance. Don't even think about it. If you get that guy hurt on the offensive side of the ball, they're never talking to him again. Definitely. All right. So how much better can you get? at corner, considering you're relatively inexperienced at the position, obviously there's more to learn, but you have those great ball skills. Your speed and agility are second to none, even for guys who are already in the league. Where do you think your ceiling is at corner? Uh, I think that's what excites me the most about myself is knowing the fact that I've only been playing defense for two years, knowing, you know, I could get so much better. I'm going to continue learning, continue, you know, um, you know, excelling at the position. But, you know, for me, at the end of the day, a football player is always going to be a football player. Um, you know, technique is important to learn. The fundamentals are important to learn. But, you know, when, when you step on that field, you have to go out there and be a complete football player, regardless of everything it is. You know, what you know just adds value to what you do. But, you know, you have to go out there and be a football player, be a playmaker at the end of the day. And for me, I think that's what is the best thing about me is my instincts and how, you know, how much of a football player I truly am. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very exciting to know that uh, my ceiling is is very high and um, there's so much more potential in what it is I'm doing. So I'm just excited to continue learning and continue getting better at the position. You listen to what some scouts I know have said about you and, and almost invariably they talk about Mike St. Ristol's really high football IQ. To you, what does that mean? Just being a student of the game. Um, you know, I find myself and, uh, you know, so this past season, I was meeting with the defensive staff every morning, uh, learning game plans. So doing things like that is what helps me to, you know, get a true understanding of, you know, why defenses are called the way they're called, why certain things are schemed up, how they're schemed up, um, you know, truly learning the opponent and then studying my, like, you know, re receivers, knowing what they like to do, knowing that, you know, certain QBs like to snap the ball at, you know, this time on the play clock, knowing what type of keys and indicators I can get. Just, you know, learning the game as a whole is what allows my IQ to be, you know, as high as it is. What about emulating other guys? Are, are there corners in the league who you watch, who maybe you try to steal some stuff from? Of course, they always say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? Yeah. Uh, so this past offseason, uh, my NFL study tape was Kenny Moore, Mike Hilton, uh, Taron Johnson. Uh, you know, watch the guys like that. Uh, Trent McDuffie as well. Just watching guys with a similar body frame as myself who play the position, definitely want to, you know, be able to see what they do and just add it to my game. At the end of the day, you know, I, I want to be the best at the position I play. So uh, seeing guys who do it at an elite level uh, day in, day out on the you know professional side, just watching them, um, you know, one day I'll be competing with those guys for, you know, the top nickel spot in the country. So if I can learn as much as I can from the people who play the position I play and just add it to what I do, it only just allows me to play better. What would you say to any critics out there who believe that your size could potentially be an issue at the next level against some of the bigger receivers? I would let them know that, you know, my position is one of the most important positions. Again, football players are football players. It doesn't matter how big they are, how little they are. You know, a guy's going to go out there and play as hard at the end of the day. So don't let my size fool you because I'll still come up and make tackles. Um, I can play in the box and I can play outside corners. So, the size means nothing. You know, where does that mentality about the run game come for you? Because typically most corners or guys who like to play coverage, especially at your size, are not guys who really like to get in the box and like to defend the run. You're someone who not only appears to enjoy that, but who really does very well in run coverage as a defensive back. Where did you learn that and where does that come from? Uh, just understanding that uh, the chip on my shoulder comes from um, – Knowing that offenses, you know, they'll see me out there at the nickel position. They'll motion me to the boundary or start me in the boundary, run a fast motion and run back towards me. And just knowing like, okay, you're going to disrespect me because you think my size is going to, you know, stop. I'm going to you know, show up in the run game. I'm going to prove you wrong. 
And, you know, that's the mentality I have is, you know, I have a chip on my shoulder that, you know, people view me as an undersized guy. And I'm just going to show you that this size, again, means nothing. And I'm going to, you know, sacrifice my body for my teammates. And I'm going to go out there and hit you. When you move into the NFL officially later this month, you'll join your former coach, Jim Harbaugh, who's now in the NFL as well. And that, of course, means that the man we already talked about, Sharon Moore, is now in charge of the Wolverines. What do you think, Coach Moore, year one? Obviously, the expectations are never going to change, regardless of whether this is your first head coaching job or not. Um, you know, for him, it's just going to be, you know, again, those guys to recommit themselves every single day, fall in love with the process every single day. Uh, you know, being back and seeing what they've been doing so far during spring ball, uh, you know, I think they're in a great, uh, great place. There's definitely some additions I know they're looking to make to, you know, the roster. But, you know, those guys are in a great, uh, great space right now. Everybody's enjoying, you know, Coach Moore being the head coach. Their vibe is really good. Um, they're hungry. They're eager to prove that they are defending champions. And, you know, come this, uh, come this fall, uh, we'll see. You know, he has a lot to prove. And, I know he has a group of guys who has his back and going to go out there and help him prove what it is that he needs to prove and what they have to prove as a team. Now, we don't have time for me to get your thoughts on all the former Wolverines who will be chosen in this spring's draft because there was a record, I think, 18 Michigan players sent to the Combine this year. But one of the most talked about was quarterback J.J. McCarthy. You got to see him every day in practice. How do you think his game projects at the next level? You know, he's another one that his potential is very high, uh, ceiling very high. He's he's young, which is, you know, very good for him. Um, and, you know, just I feel like the offense that he played in definitely uh, limited the, you know, the talent that he has. But he did what he had to do on our offense. You know, he led us. He, uh, he won games. That's something that can never be taken away from him is the amount of games he was able to win. He's a national championship quarterback. Uh, so, like, you know, his record, his resume is, is very good, if you ask me. And I know he's going to go out there, he's going to compete, and he wants to prove that he is a top quarterback in this class. So I'm excited to see what he does at the next level. A phenomenal college career has come to a close for Mike Sainter still, but that just starts the next chapter. Wait to hear his name called later this month at the NFL Draft. Hey, Mike, congrats on an amazing run during your time in Ann Arbor. Good luck later this month when the draft takes place in Detroit. We look forward to seeing you this fall in the NFL. Sounds good. Thank you. I appreciate you guys for having me on. Big Ten baseball standings heading into this weekend's action. You see Illinois 7-2 and two in the league. Nebraska just behind. Purdue, Michigan, Ohio State, Indiana, the only other teams above 500 in league play right now. Nebraska really the only team sniffing around those national rankings. Rick Pizzo back with Mike Huff. Continuing our weekend previews, we touched on all but two series set to go this weekend. Let's touch on those now Indiana, Minnesota certainly hasn't been the year the Hoosiers have expected and the Gophers trying to send John Anderson off after 43, 43 years, years in yeah. great form. Crazy to think that he was the head coach when I was playing at Northwestern. That's a long time ago, folks. But you're right, Indiana, you think about Jeff Mercer. This was a club preseason ranked second, and I felt that was a good ranking for them. So many names that were now seasoned veterans like the Cernies, the Tibbets, the Paynes, the Mathesons, and then you had the freshman of the year, Devin Taylor. So you knew the these guys were going to hit and hit a lot for them just to be a few games over 500 right now overall is just a huge surprise and like you said Minnesota led by Brady Council yes that's Craig Council the Cubs manager's son leading them in just about every offensive category it's going to be interesting to see how that season how that series yeah. plays out all right final series of the weekend Penn State Michigan State what should we be watching for well again just I think a lot of development from both of these you think about Mike Gambino is the first year at Penn State. He's done a great job with the transfer portal, bringing in some guys, understanding his type of game and his system. And right now, two of their top three hitters are from the transfer portal, so they're a dangerous ball club. And for Jake Boss, it's young. They lost a lot of talent last year. So he's just trying to, again, build a foundation with a young team that's going to have some success looking forward. Uh, Friday night game, 8 o'clock Eastern. You can see it right here on the Big Ten Network. We're just about... I guess maybe at the midway point. We're pretty close pretty in terms close. of conference place. Let's get Mike's midseason awards. Just talked about a couple of terrific coaches, including yes. Jake Boss. Uh, who is the midseason coach of the year? Well, for me right now, I'm going to go with Will Bolt. 
Here's the guy that you lost your unbelievable up the middle combination we talked about earlier. You think about Mathis, you think about uh, Anderson, you think about these guys that had over 40 home runs, 130 plus RBIs between the two of them. And they were preseason ranked fifth, sixth within the Big Ten, which felt good. But he has them playing on a national scale. The games he's lost in the non conference against nationally ranked teams, he was losing by one or two runs. So they were purporting themselves well, and I think that really helped them step up when they got to the Big Ten Conference. Yeah, and the only team, as I mentioned, kind of sniffing around those top 25 rankings right now. Huge series against Maryland. Yes. Disappointed to lose that game to Creighton, but you come back and take two out of three or sweep the Terps, and suddenly you're in really good shape, and you may not have to run the table in Omaha to get the auto bid. Freshman of the year at the midseason point is who? Uh, this one might have been the easiest one of them I all. I figured. Uh, pitcher... Also pretty easy, but Luke Gaffney, a redshirt freshman, granted, from Purdue, in the Big Ten, he's hitting over 400 second, third in OPS, first in runs scored for a power hitter, second in hits, first in RBIs. This is a redshirt freshman for Penn State. So he is on everything. For, Purdue. for, for Purdue. Purdue. Yes, yes, yes. Um, came in as a catcher, playing first base now because they have a veteran catcher right now. But Luke Gaffney, freshman of the year, easy for the Purdue Boilermakers. All right, so they break up the pitching awards into reliever and starting pitcher of the year. Let's go with the midseason reliever of the year. Yeah, this is going to go to Rutgers' Joey DiCaro. I mean, right now, Nebraska has three or four guys, two actually that have done a really good job, four saves, three saves. But Joey has five saves leading the Big Ten, has a 2-5 ERA, incredibly solid. Opponents batting average, 167. So when you put those types of things as a closer, 14.1 innings and 20 strikeouts, he's a guy coming in that people aren't getting hits. You feel pretty comfortable if you're Steve Owens. And in the college game, I think folks look at the stats too much. You're just not going to see the kind of save stats in the no. college game that you see in majors. No. Nope. I mean, nobody's touching Bobby Thigpen. No, Bobby, Bobby's in pretty good. Yeah, Bobby's in pretty good shape these days. All right, let's go to starting pitcher now. And this has been such a position of strength and depth in the Big Ten over the last couple of years. And coming in, there were some very highly touted starting pitchers. Yes. Who's the midseason starting pitcher of the year in the Big Ten? Well, there were three or four incredibly highly touted. One, Brody Brecht, which we've talked about, a young man that can touch 100 easy. Potential top 10 pick. And a couple other arms for Iowa. Jason Cinebaldi for Rutgers. Yep. But Brett Sears for Nebraska. And, of course, I predicted this one no, because he had so a, a 12 ERA three years ago, a 6 ERA two years ago, a 5 ERA last year, and a paltry 1-3-2 ERA, leading the Big Ten 6-0. and But, again, just doing a great job. Opponent's batting average is a 141, 60 strikeouts to only 10 walks. So here's someone that has this just wealth of confidence. And I'm not sure for everyone it takes a little something – for a pitcher to click, uh, we've talked about this in the pack. Coming up with the Dodgers system and organization, Sandy Koufax got to meet him a handful of times, and it took Sandy like three or four pitching coaches before someone mm. said something that all of a sudden everything started to click. So for Brett Sears, I feel like he's found that phrase, that pitching routine that's got him into that zone, and he has not left it at all this year. You think it's like the Mayan lava lizard? It could very well be, yeah. Islands. We're not going to talk about the stuff under we the uniform. We'll do the, uh, the lava Family lizard show. stuff. Family show. Family and show. And finally, at the midseason right now, who's the Big Ten Player of the Year? I have a feeling this was kind of an easy selection as yeah, well. Yeah, this also was pretty fun for me. Josh Carota grauer this the, the, the outstanding infielder from Rutgers, went to the Cape where I was very fortunate to get to play out in Falmouth one summer. The most challenging of all summer collegiate Wooden bats, leagues. baby. Wooden bats, and he got the MVP. So he came into the season feeling good about himself and understanding he has to take a leadership role because there were so many good bats that have come through that Rutgers program and has done it. He is leading the Big Ten with a 455 batting average. Just, just mind-boggling. For me, he's also second in the Big Ten in stolen bases. He is playing a great defense. So this young man is doing everything right, trying to lead a club that has lots of talent that right now is on the outside looking in as an at-large. But if they can get hot and continue to win series, get hot in the Big Ten. Great stuff, chance. as always, from Michael Huff here in studio. And thanks to our guests, terrific guests today, including Neil Shipley, Mike Sainer still, and Scott Dockerman. That'll wrap up this edition of Big Ten today. As always, we appreciate the hang.